Welcome all to the first session of the eighth running of DFIN 511, Introduction to Digital Currency at the University of Nicosia. Uh, before I begin this session, I'd like to take a few moments to give you all a little bit of background about this specific course, the overall degree program that this course is a part of, the University of Nicosia, that is the university that offers this course, and a little bit about myself will be one of your two instructors on this course. The other co-instructor you'll meet, Andreas Andonopoulos, you'll meet next week in next week's session. DFIN 511 is the first cryptocurrency course ever offered by a university. And we believe the most consistently popular one. It was offered by the University of Nicosia for the first time in spring 2014. And that was the first time any university ever offered an academic course in these topic areas relating to cryptocurrencies, to blockchain, and the general topics that all started with the invention of Bitcoin. It is structured as what is known as a MOOC course, that is a massively open online course. It means that anyone can attend the course without paying a tuition fee. Uh, this session we have this fall is the largest group we've ever had. Uh, there are 4,130 of your classmates in this course. So in other words, we have a medium-sized university's worth of students that are going to be taking the course with you. It's awesome. It's amazing. It's going to be a great network of people who are interested in cryptocurrency, blockchain, Bitcoin, ICOs, and everything else that lives in this ecosystem. Uh, the number of students who have taken this course in total is now well over 10,000 students, and you're joining a pretty interesting group of people, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. The course itself uh, has been co-taught since inception by me and Andreas Andonopoulos. Andreas Andonopoulos is a well-known technical expert and evangelist uh, for cryptocurrency. In fact, he wrote one of the best known books in this field and you will be meeting him next week in next week's session and he'll be able to speak more about his background then george baba your who's another instructor here at the university of nicosia has also been part of this course from the beginning and he manages the course uh, he is active in the forums in the learning management system online he is uh critical uh to this course and also is very, very, very knowledgeable about cryptocurrency and this overall field. The course will run for 12 weeks. I am responsible for the first week session, which is today. Then Andreas will teach the next six weeks on more technical topics, uh, such as how does Bitcoin reach consensus, how to make a paper wallet, how to actually execute a Bitcoin transaction. And then after you've gone through the technical piece, you're back to me for five more weeks of, let's call them, more general, more applied topics, like what does cryptocurrency mean for financial systems? What regulation applies for cryptocurrency? What's the use of cryptocurrency in the developing world? Uh, what are all these other things that are coming up, uh, Ethereum, ICOs, et cetera, et cetera? So we'll be a little bit more broad on the second half and a little bit more technical on the first half of the course. The teaching model for this course, or the learning model for this course, is as follows. Every week, we release a new set of reading material. It's in the online management, learning management system that I believe you all have access to. You read the material by yourselves at your own time. There are exercises that you will be uh, doing online in the learning management system. And so there you answer, and so your peers also answer, and it's like a discussion forum that are the exercises. At the end of the week, there is a quiz, and at the end of the week, there is also a live session with either Andreas or me. The way we structure the program is that the live sessions are meant to be to answer questions. So it's what's known as flipped learning. You need to read the material in advance. There's going to be topics that you have a question about, you submit them through the system. George is going to compile them, and we will try and answer as many of them as possible in the live sessions. Of course, some things might not make it to a live session, and those are excellent things to discuss in the forums online. 
So depending on how busy a certain session is or not, we might have more or fewer uh, set questions for the live session. At the end of this course, I'm comfortable saying the following. You will know more about terms like blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, ICOs, Ethereum, the 99.999% of the population, including, to be honest, most of the people who write on these write about these topics uh, in the media. Uh, there is a lot of incorrect or partially correct information that we read online on a regular basis. And so by going through this course, you're going to be at the very, very high end of the curve in terms of knowledge about this topic area. And I encourage you to go through all 12 sessions. This, generally, MOOCs do not have high completion rates. This MOOC is the one exception I know. People who have enrolled in it are typically very passionate about this topic. They're very interested about this topic. They think it will become important somehow in their future careers or lives. And so we have a very high completion rate. I would like for your sakes to continue that very high completion rate. We think we cover important topics all the way through. Some of them are sexier than others, but we think they're all actually quite important. Um, so we encourage you to go all the way through to the end of the course. If you complete nine of the 12 quizzes and score at least a 60% on the final, then you will receive a certificate of accomplishment from the University of Nicosia. And what's interesting, it will also be published into the Bitcoin blockchain. This course was all, in addition to being the first university course about cryptocurrency, it was the first university course to publish a certificate into the blockchain. And the University of Nicosia was also the first university to publish academic diplomas into the blockchain last year for students on this uh, program. And this year, we actually published all of our academic diplomas to the Bitcoin blockchain. So there you will have, you will be in the permanent record of the very early days of this breakthrough area in computer science and in distributed systems and in ledgers and in finance, law, and many other areas. So I encourage you to go all the way through, get your certificate, be a part of this permanent record and history. Now. Before we jump into questions, let me tell you a little bit about who the what the University of Nicosia is, uh, what program this course is part of, because this is part of a broader uh, degree program. I'll tell you a little bit about myself, and then we'll jump into things. The University of Nicosia is the largest university in Cyprus, and we believe the largest university in Southern Europe that teaches in English. There are about 11,500 degree-seeking students at the university. There's about another six to 7,000 students who are attending professional programs associated with the university. So on a total headcount basis, we're close to 18,000 students, of which 11,500 are degree seeking. It's a comprehensive university. It's based here in Nicosia, Cyprus. Uh, it has six different schools, 18 departments, 100 degree programs. It's very well known for its medical school. That is a partnership with the University of London, uh, which was the first medical school in Cyprus. But we're also strong in a variety of other areas, law, accounting, uh, computer science, international relations. And we're one of the, in the areas that we focus on, one of the leading universities of this area. We also have an extensive set of online programs, of which this is a part of. So this degree program, you do not have to move to Cyprus to attend it. It's taught online, and it is taught, as are most of our programs, in English. So you do not have to be a Greek speaker to either attend this specific course or the overall program or the University of Nicosia. Beyond the normal university-type items that you'd see at every university, um, we have an orientation to some rapidly developing advanced technologies. Uh, a few years ago, we've uh, this year we formalized some initiatives we've been working on for the last few years in the Institute for the Future that operates across our whole university and focuses on three topics. Blockchain technologies and cryptocurrency and how they apply in different disciplines. 
uh, artificial intelligence and how it applies in different disciplines, and augmented and virtual reality and how it applies in different disciplines. We are big believers in that we are entering a period of significant technological and therefore societal change, and we would like to be at the forefront of understanding what that means academically, what that means from a research perspective, what that means from a program perspective, and what that is going to mean for our students. What do they need to know in order to be successful over the next 5, 10, 50 years of their lives and careers? So um, I think we tend to be pretty uh, forward thinking on these topics. Now, this course is part of a degree program, a Master of Science in Digital Currency, that was the first university degree program in the world focused on this topic. It also launched in spring 2014. It is a, about a year and a half long master's degree, though you can take it at your pace. Some students take longer. It is nine courses of 10 ECTS. These are the European credits or five equivalent credit hours in the American system. And students who complete this course, but you have to actually complete it and uh, receive the certificate of accomplishment, who then enroll in the master's program, this course counts as the first class in the master's program. And so that takes, you get effectively credit for the first of the nine courses in the master's program, and then you only have to take eight more to graduate with a master's in digital currency. This program has been amazing. It is, I think, one of our most interesting programs at the university. We have 200 students currently enrolled. The first graduates were two years ago. Uh, unbelievable set of people, a little bit non-traditional, in my opinion, in that it wasn't just people coming directly out of undergraduate programs, though there are some of those. There were also people at all types of stages in their careers doing all types in all types of professions who have attended the program. And so every session you will find in the uh, program, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, we've had central bankers, we've had doctors, we've had regulators, we've had academics, we've had almost any background you can imagine. And what ties these folks together is that they believe this area is going to be an important area in the world at large going forward. They'd like to get a more structured understanding of this area across a variety of topics, and they think that will help them in their career. And so the program looks at both some technical topics relating directly to cryptocurrency, but also there's a course, for example, on regulation and cryptocurrency. We call that the stay out of jail course, um, because it is actually, the idea is not to make you a lawyer, but to know what type of areas in this field tend to be regulated and there are uh, requirements that need to be followed. Uh, there's a course on open financial systems where you say, how does this apply to payment systems? How does this apply to insurance companies? How does this apply to accounting firms? Then at the end of the course, there are the last three courses you can take a more business track, which most folks have done which is you are meant to be a general manager somewhere in a business or organization that is involved somehow in cryptocurrency or digital currency. And then there's a technical track for folks with a more technical developer-oriented background, and you can take the technical courses instead. What we have seen is um, folks graduating from this program, and so far there's been, I think, about 30 graduates because the numbers have been ramping up, have gone on to do a wide range of super interesting things. They tend to have a lot of job offers. Uh, whenever I am at a conference on this topic, very big, very well-known companies are always asking how they can get access to the graduates of this program. There is an estimate of how many people today work in this field at large, and it's a few thousand people. And this field at large probably needs a few hundred thousand people to live up to its potential. So anyone who can demonstrate that they have a structured skill set in this area, I think is going to be in very high demand from banks, uh, professional services firms, 
accounting firms, law firms, from governments, from regulators, and from startups focused in the space. Because what someone with this degree will have is not need handholding on day one of learning how this whole field works. So we've seen all types of outcomes from people who have graduated. A good chunk go on to start their own businesses. One of them went and started a fund. Some of them were actually involved in some fairly well-known cryptocurrency startups. Some of them went into big companies, banks, consulting firms, etc. One of them worked at a central bank. So there's the full spectrum of outcomes for students on this program. But I think it is clearly the case that there is a lot of demand for folks with this skill set. So if it turns out that you are interested in this program, our next start is in the beginning of spring 2018. We just closed the group for fall 2017. Some of you might have already spoken as you were signing up for the MOOC to Irene Patricios. She heads uh, recruiting and admissions for this program. And so please do get in touch with her or feel free to get in touch with George or your you and they'll be happy to walk you through uh, how this uh, program works and what are the requirements to actually be admitted formally as a student to this program. I'll also mention a couple other things we're working on. Uh, we're involved in various research projects in the space. We are building a platform that we have used first on our own, but we're going to make available to other organizations on an open source basis to publish documents into the Bitcoin blockchain. We are hosting a conference here in Cyprus uh, this fall on any topic relating to decentralization at large. And I would encourage you, if you are in the neighborhood and can get to the conference, to get in touch with one of us and see if you can sign up. There are special rates for students and we have a handful of small scholarships available uh, that are even further subsidized. The conference is called Decentralized. It is at decentralized.com. And there is a great set of speakers coming to the conference. And it is November 2nd and 3rd in Limassol. And Limassol is the second largest city in Cyprus. It's by the beach. The weather should most likely be beautiful still in November. But that's not why you're coming. You're coming because we think it will be one of the major uh, Mediterranean or European conferences on this topic uh, over the course of this year. Last but not least, I'd say the following. You might have noticed we're fairly active in this space. We are, in fact, quite active in this space. By most external observers' view, we have, as a university, the most comprehensive, largest initiative in cryptocurrency, blockchain, decentralization between our faculty, our full-time faculty, our part-time faculty, and our administrative staff working on this topic. We have over 30 people working on it. Many other great universities are also working on this topic, but many of them might have one or two or five or 10. And there's a few that are a little more developed. But most external uh, organizations from the industry that have said who has the most developed initiatives in the space have said that we are currently number one in the world. And we are certainly uh, clearly the folks that have started doing this earliest and most intensively. And the reason is we believed very early on, back when it was still a controversial point of view, that the point of Bitcoin or cryptocurrency was not, is it going to go up in value? Is it going to go down in value? Are you going to get rich overnight? Um, is it deflationary? Is it inflationary? Is it any of those things? None of these things were the important point. We thought the decentralized consensus mechanism uh, through the Bitcoin blockchain that was literally invented for the first time in the 2009 was an important breakthrough in computer science and a breakthrough that is going to allow any type of ledger to be decentralized. Now, what that means, it's an almost endless topic because once you start looking for ledgers around you, they are everywhere. Um, your hotel reservation is in a ledger. Your title deed to your house is in a ledger. Your car rental is in a ledger. Uh, the students at the University of Nicosia are in a ledger. Now, these ledgers are called different things depending on the industry and the usage case, but they're all 
a centralized ledger that has a trusted third party that is in charge of that ledger. The big breakthrough here is that you can have a ledger that is trustworthy, but that does not have one specific person in charge. It is an equivalent shift to what happened with the Internet for Information Distribution. Before the early 90s, if you wanted to publish information, you were going through some type of centralized gatekeeper, whether it was at a newspaper, at a magazine, at a TV station, there was an editor of sorts, uh, editor, in fact, that had to sign off to say this thing is going to be published there. And the internet came along and it basically allowed anyone to publish in a decentralized manner. If you hooked up a web server to the internet, you could publish. Now, I remember back then there was a lot of anxiety about that. What do you mean? Anyone can write anything? Um, that's weird. Who's going to check to see if it's okay to be written? And it turns out, and the answer to that question is nobody. And um, there's good and bad aspects about the internet, but it has been an overwhelmingly wonderful thing for the world to be able to distribute information outside of centralized gatekeepers. And we have had a whole explosion of products and services on the internet that were not possible before this decentralized, no central gatekeeper method. Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum, whatever version you want to call it, is that same topic for ledgers or alternatively things of value. It is a way to have things that have value, things that you want to be scarce, to work without a central gatekeeper in charge. We believe we are still at the beginning of a 20, 30 year period where we figure out what this means. To some level, as we stand now with a bunch of folks like me who grew up in a world with centralized ledgers, we probably don't even understand what are the types of services people are going to invent. You know, in 1993, when people started making their first websites online, no one was thinking about Twitter. It took 15, 20 years for people to think through that something like Twitter would be a good idea, and it turned out to be a very popular service. And those folks tend to be people that grew up natively with the Internet. I think what we'll start seeing over time is, in addition to the obvious ideas that are just corally, corollaries of existing services, oh, look, it's money transmittance. It's like, it's like money transmittance in the real world, the physical world. Um, so you'll have those types of products now. In a few years, you'll start to see the products that anyone who grew up with centralized ledgers wouldn't have thought of. Because as you'll have a new generation of folks taking it for granted that you can have decentralized services, decentralized currencies, you will see a new set of ideas come through. So we think it's a super exciting space. We think this is just at the beginning of this area where we believe one of the leaders of this area and plan to continue to be one of the leaders of this area. And there's a lot of passion at the university and among the team on this topic. Lastly, very briefly about myself, my background is historically in financial services and technology, which is why I got interested in this early. I was a partner at a financial consulting firm in New York for several years in their private equity practice. I was a partner in a private equity firm in New York managing certain uh, industries there. I've also been involved with the founding or development of certain technological startups, including some early users of web-based services. And my, I've been on the board of the university for several years now. And as of about a year ago, I actually moved from Manhattan to Cyprus and I'm running the administrative and financial aspects, not the academic, the administrative and financial aspects of the university as CEO of the university. So from my perspective, coming from a finance and technology background, um, relatively early on, though uh, possibly I could have figured this out earlier, but by 2013, I thought this was quite interesting and have a lot of uh, implications. So. I've been involved in setting up the program along with many of our professors here and our great administrative team. I will be here on this course and I co-teach one of the other courses on the program. And I would encourage you all to feel free 
to reach out to me, ideally in one of two methods. I'm fairly active on Twitter at, at Polamidis. Um, so if you follow me there and DM me, I'll probably follow you back. And that tends to be a pretty good way to reach me. Um, I generally also will follow back on LinkedIn. That's another way to reach me. Realistically, I will probably respond faster to a Twitter DM than any other method of reaching me, which is strange, but I think that's actually true. Um, I can't promise I will be able to help in all circumstances, but if I can give a helpful pointer when I can, I would be happy to do so. So that's the introduction. That's the context for what we'll be doing the next 12 weeks. I am thrilled that you guys are all joining us. As you've already noticed from the live chat, you are literally from every single part of the world, and that is very exciting to us. Um, this is uh, a community that is not concentrated just in a certain tech hub like Silicon Valley or Boston. It truly is a global community, and I think it makes it much more interesting for everyone. So with that, I'm going to try and answer some of the questions that came in. There was a huge set of questions that came in, so I might not get to all of them, and I might not get to yours. Uh, do not feel badly if that's the case. Please post it online, and we'll try and answer it in the forums. But there was really a very large set of questions that came up. So with that, I'm going to start the questions. Has money in the past ever been tied as closely as Bitcoin is to freedom of speech and the right to privacy? Very interesting and tricky question. And I'm going to split it because my answer to one and the other is different. The idea, the central idea by most people involved in Bitcoin on the development side is that its main characteristic is that it is uncensorable. Uncensorable means there is an absence of a central party or a mechanism by which someone could put pressure on a central party or parties and say, shut this down, stop it from working, reverse this transaction. And Bitcoin is by no means the first digital currency. There were many non-state digital currencies before Bitcoin. Most of them either failed because they were some version of a scam or failed because they were centralized and they ended up violating some type of money transmittal or money service business laws of some type. And because they were centralized, people could come find these centralized people and say, please shut this down or we will charge you with various uh, crimes or violations of regulations and what have you. So kind of the key idea behind Bitcoin is that there's no central party in charge there's no CEO of Bitcoin. There's no Bitcoin Incorporated. There's not one place you can go visit and say, hey, guys, we're not comfortable with this payment from this party to that party, or we don't like that you're doing this. Please stop doing it. That means indirectly and to some degree by accident, it is, I think, more a platform from freedom of speech than any monetary system we've seen before. And through a little bit of a hackish mechanism, but it's real, you can enter into the, let's, for argument's sake, call it comments field of a Bitcoin transaction, a statement. Antonis Polamidis is, uh, has brown eyes. And let's say someone found that a very objectionable statement and the government of a certain country thought that was a horrible thing to say and they didn't want you to say it. There is really no practical way that statement can be erased because the Bitcoin nodes are spread around the world. There are several thousand copies of the Bitcoin blockchain all around the world. Anyone can download and start another copy of the Bitcoin blockchain. And so you'd have to go across hundreds of jurisdictions, thousands of people, and try and shut down their copy. And my guess is as you're doing that, other people will fire up other nodes. And then people are doing some even funner things now. They're working on saying, how can we get some nodes into orbit? 
How can we get copies of the blockchain in space? How can we get block copies of the blockchain on a drone? How can we get things in a way that they can't easily be censored? And so I think from the question of freedom of speech, it is truly different as a uh, platform than any financial system I can think of. And it's because it's universally accessible, right? Like I could write something on a dollar bill and hand it out. And yeah, it might not be the easiest thing to censor that dollar bill because someone would have to find it among millions of dollar bills, but it also wouldn't be particularly well published. It's not as if you could go read while you're, if I put, wrote it on a dollar bill in New York and you live in Thailand, it would be difficult to read my message that said, Antonis has brown eyes on the dollar bill. So it would be hard for someone to find it and stop it, but it would also not actually distributable. So here you can send the message. It would be uh, shortly all around the world, readable by anyone, and very hard to reverse. That is something relatively new. I mean, there's similar examples like in Tor and file distribution or what have you. There's parallels to this, but nothing quite like this in its permanence. So uh, I think that's something we haven't seen before. Right to privacy is a mixed bag. Bitcoin is pseudonymous, more or less, not truly anonymous. And the way most people use it, which is without highly, highly complex operational security, it's not particularly anonymous at all. It's reasonably easy that someone could actually figure out who you are or narrow it down to a set of people that you could have been. So despite what the popular media somehow says, sometimes says, Bitcoin is not a particularly great platform to go do things that you want to be completely anonymous. Um, so if you're thinking it's a wonderful way to engage in illegal activities or try and hide X, Y, Z, yeah, it's not great. It's not, it's more anonymous than your credit card. It's more anonymous than your bank account, but it's less anonymous than cash. Cash is definitely more anonymous than Bitcoin. There are other cryptocurrencies that are working on this topic. These are currencies like Monero and Zcash, whose focus is building in greater privacy, greater fungibility, so that it really will become impossible to say who did this transaction and who does it tie back to. But those are still fairly early stage in their development. Uh, I don't think they're fully mature. I don't think we can say for sure that this topic has been accomplished. So I would say freedom of speech, definitely the most. Right to privacy, uh, less than cash. And it's interesting, when you see most regulator reports, central bank reports, where the report was clearly made to conclude that cryptocurrency is a very bad thing and is going to have all types of negative outcomes, most of the time the report comes back and says, well, the best way to do illegal activities today is still in good old-fashioned uh, U.S. dollars and euros um, because those are truly anonymous and quite fungible. So I think that's where we stand today and with a question mark on if these new currencies can become, in my opinion, not more private than cash, but equivalently private uh, as cash. Um, next question. With Bitcoin seen mainly as a store of value, more so than a medium of exchange, how will we prevent the hoarding of money problem and its impact on economic activity and employment? I've gotten this question every single time we've run uh, this course. My summary answer is that it is not a concern and it is not a relevant question, and I'll explain why. Defla and the general way this is described is like, isn't deflation gonna be a problem? Now what's deflation? Deflation means prices of things go down over time. So if we have a television, and today it costs $100 to buy the television, tomorrow it costs $99 to buy the television. It's deflationary. Inflation is today it costs 100, and tomorrow it costs 101. Modern monetary policy believes that it is better for the environment to be slightly inflationary. 
maybe one or two percent. Most central banks have a two percent target. The reason for that is that it is a mild inducement to spend money and then for the economy to function. And the way to think about this is imagine something that an economy that was highly deflationary. You could buy this TV today for $100, but if you come back tomorrow, it's going to be 95 Most people might say if they don't have an absolutely urgent need from that TV, they'll wait till tomorrow. Tomorrow when they come back and it's 95 by now the store is anxious because no one's buying TV, so they've cut the price to 90 Was it all? It's gone down to 90 let's wait another day. The store drops the price further. It goes 85 and people don't transact. They don't transact. They don't consume. The factories don't work, people are unemployed, and we're producing fewer real goods than we would have otherwise. Whereas if there's a little bit of an incentive to spend, your money might be worth a little bit less tomorrow and the next day than it is today. Uh, there's more of an incentive, okay, well, let's buy this car, TV, boat, piece of land today, because maybe tomorrow it will be worth more and more expensive. So modern central banks tend to have a slight inflationary bias. Now, Bitcoin is, by this model, highly deflationary, right? If you took a TV, say, in 2013, you could buy a TV for one Bitcoin. And today, you would need 0 0.06 Bitcoins to buy that same $300 TV. So TVs as priced in Bitcoins are, in fact, deflationary. Is that a problem for the overall economy? Does it doesn't have an impact on economic activity and employment. I don't think so because Bitcoin right now, and I believe for the foreseeable future, is not the unit of account for any major economy. So to the degree that TVs are not actually priced in Bitcoins, but they are priced in dollars, then it doesn't have these effects that people are concerned about. The way to think about Bitcoin from this perspective is closer to a successful stock. So if you said, I bought Apple stock 10 years ago, and said, how many TVs can I buy for one share of Apple stock, the exact same effect would be happening. If you had spent that one Apple stock, one stock of Apple Inc. for a TV today, you'd need a much smaller number of Apple stocks to buy that TV. But nobody thinks to themselves, oh my goodness, are we going to have deflationary effects in the economy because these shares of Apple are going up in value? As we stand today, I believe this is what's happening with Bitcoin. By the way, I would not assume necessarily that all cryptocurrencies are going to go up at all time. Uh, I think um, I know a lot of people believe that. It is certainly very easy to believe that today as we stand uh, at the during a very large surge in the price of cryptocurrencies. But if you look at cryptocurrencies, they go up, they go down, um, they go all over the place. So there might be a point in the future where this is a concern. I don't think it's a concern today. Bitcoin today and all cryptocurrencies in general are a very small percentage of world assets. Um, I think earlier this week, the total value of all Bitcoins was around 70 something billion dollars. The total value of all Ethereum, which was second, was around 33, 35 billion dollars. That is an epically large number for a tech startup, but it's a tiny number by the size of asset classes in general. Uh, estimates for the value of gold are seven to 10 trillion dollars. So two more zeros than either. Bitcoin or Ethereum. All asset classes as a whole across the world are measured in hundreds of trillions of dollars. So we aren't anywhere near the point where cryptocurrency is going to have a systemic effect on an economy. Of course, people who think uh, there will be dramatic and increased growth in the value of cryptocurrency for a very long time, I think maybe someday there will be an effect. But that's not today's problem. So today, I would worry about all the things that are today's problems to worry about, and we'll see what will happen uh, in the future.
what are the main characteristics of fiat currencies? If it is not redeemable for any commodity, then would Bitcoin also be fiat? Fiat is a loaded term. Like in theory, it's not a loaded term. It's just a technical term. But people tend, particularly in our community, to use fiat in a negative manner. That fiat is bad. Fiat is uh, either forced on you or fiat is something that's not real. Uh, people, people of this category start with thinking something like, well, gold is real money because you have something tangible. Gold has value beyond its usage case as money. It's what is known as commodity money. And fiat is something that the government just says, hey, we can, let's use dollars, and the government just said so. I prefer to use, I think it is more accurate to use the term sovereign money, so the money of a nation state. Um, I think Bitcoin is not exactly like sovereign money. I think it is closer to commodity money. And so let's talk about what this means. So when we say gold is commodity money, we say, well, gold has value outside of being a medium of exchange or a store of value. It is used for jewelry. It is used for electrical conductors. It is used by companies that want to sell you possibly overpriced cables for your stereos with very shiny gold tips. So uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they you do need to be gold. Uh, it is sprinkled over elite decadent desserts. So people like gold for reasons beyond its money function. But if you look at gold carefully, it's hard to believe that the commodity value of gold has anything to do with the price of all the gold in circulation. Today, gold's value also includes in some form of a self-fulfilling prophecy, its value as a store of value. And there's reasons for this. We're not going to cover them uh, now in the live session, but like it's actually fairly fungible and you can and uh, holds up well and travels long distances and blah, 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 blah. So a big part of its value isn't actually the industrial commodity value. It's its money value. Bitcoin kind of looks like that to me. The commodity value of Bitcoin is it allows you to send a certain set of value through a digital transaction online. So if I want, uh, I am in Nicosia today and George is in Athens. And let's say I want to make an instant digital payment to him uh, using Bitcoin. And George has asked me for a thousand euros. If I want to send them a thousand euros of Bitcoin, I need a thousand euros of Bitcoin. I can't do it by sending one Satoshi worth of Bitcoin. I need a thousand euros worth of Bitcoin. So it is like a container to move a thousand euros worth of Bitcoin. That's what you're buying at its essence. But as with gold, I believe there is beyond this commodity piece, there is some type of store value effect going on that if we and stores of value are interesting and they're tricky and they look very strange in advance. And it's why you have such different reactions um, when people look at Bitcoin's run up in price. There are very, very smart people that look at it and say, oh, this is just the beginning. This thing is going to become a multi trillion dollar asset class. And then there's other very, very smart people, I mean, truly very, very smart people, say, like, oh my God, everyone's having a massive, mass delusional incident, how can they think this funny money is worth anything? It's just a bubble. And uh, while I note I will never make in this course any Bitcoin price predictions because I, I value my sanity, the reality is the forming of a form of store of value is not inconsistent with how Bitcoin is behaving. It's also not inconsistent with a bubble. So to some degree, some things are because we all believe that they are, right? And so gold became the store of value because it had some type of characteristics. But the reason gold is a store of value today isn't because I am personally looking at gold and thinking about its chemical composition and if it's going to corrode and if it's easy to break into smaller pieces and if it transports well and blah, 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 blah. 
and if it's sufficiently scarce, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not consciously making all these decisions because when I was a kid and I first learned about gold, I learned that gold is valuable. And why is gold valuable? Well, because gold was valuable when my parents were alive and then when their parents were alive and then when their parents, 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 parents were alive and then I was like, okay, this thing's valuable. And you know, the value goes up and down because any type of commodity money tends to not be the absolute smoothest in price and neither will Bitcoin because with sovereign or fiat currencies, you have a counterparty, a lender of last resort, the central bank, who is trying to manage its uh, some type of price stability. And with commodity, there's no, there tends to be no lender of last resort trying to manage that price and goals like that and Bitcoins like that too. So it goes up and down, but historically it's been a valuable thing to hold some gold. And then if, so I'm new to life and I learned that gold is a valuable thing and that people are willing to pay $1,000 an ounce for gold, then I might be willing to pay $1,000 an ounce for gold. Not because I can actually go and justify that if everyone decided they didn't want to use gold, that the next day I could go do a thousand worth of other activities with that gold. We said there's industrial usage, but it's not going to be a thousand dollars per ounce or thirteen hundred dollars per ounce, or whatever it is now for industrial purposes. So, to some degree, store of value happens because everyone kind of coalesces around a store of value, and it's strange because it's kind of indistinguishable, to be honest, between uh, something that is in a bubble of mass delusion and something that's in the early stages of becoming a store of value. And this is why you just have this constant, as long as I've been involved in the space, constant people who might be very, very smart, very, very nice people who would understand each other perfectly well if they're talking about stocks and bonds or, or you know, who won the football game last night look at each other when it comes to Bitcoin and each think the other person is completely delusional. You know, kind of Bitcoin uh, proponents like, well, this is obviously a valuable thing. It's the first truly digital decentralized money. It's something that is fairly hard to seize. It's easy to move across jurisdictions and there's 21 million of them. And, you know, there's the case that there was, you know, there's like 50 million millionaires in the world. So if every millionaire just wanted one, there aren't enough to go around. So what's the price of that? A lot. And then someone else is like, you know, it's like funny money. And there's a thousand cryptocurrencies and there's no real scarcity because, you know, there's Bitcoin and then there's Bitcoin Cash and then there's going to be Bitcoin Seg 2X and then there's Litecoin and another thousand. So have you guys like all collectively taken leave of your senses uh, by thinking these things are worth tens of billions of dollars? The reality is no one knows for sure, there's both there's logical arguments on both on both sides, but it is absolutely the case that store of value is a very strange creature. It's not totally. It's not like something that you check the box and say one plus two plus three equals store of value. Um, in fact, it's very very difficult to make a private currency. Bitcoin is definitely a private currency. It's not a sovereign currency. It's a private decentralized currency. It is very difficult to make a private currency succeed as a store of value. And more or less all prior pri private digital currencies fail to become a store of value. And the reason is you don't trust the issuer. So let's say tomorrow I've decided to issue Polymetus coins. And because I've heard scarcity is important for my coins to be valuable, I'm going to say, well, there are 21 million Bitcoins, but there are only 21,000 Polymetus coins. So obviously these things must be worth a thousand times more than a Bitcoin. Well, not really, because of two reasons. First of all, do you really have the confidence that I'm not secretly allocating Polymetus coins to myself on the side. Number one problem with all prior digital current private digital currencies. And by the way, still an issue with when people talk about central bank credibility when it comes to inflation, it is a long-standing view of how that central bank has acted and are they going to increase the money supply or not? And there's a few kind of developed countries that have been able to keep fairly steady prices for 
sovereign slash fiat currency for a long time, and a lot of countries that have not been able to do that. So it's the same. It's that same credibility question. And then the thing is, does anyone? Is there any usage case to it? And so the first part was solved by it being decentralized. And it says like here, it says here in the code that we're going to make 21 million of these things, and so long as we all just run the same code, there's going to be 21 million of these things. And it's not like there's some central place, Bitcoin or whatever you want to call it, it's just the group of people who are writing that set of code. And you know, they're going to argue now with the forks and who gets to use the name, but it doesn't change the fundamental consensus mechanism that the people running this set of code are running this cryptocurrency, and the people running that other set of code are running that cryptocurrency. And you can choose to run what you want to run. If you want to run a node that has 21 million Bitcoins, or coins, let's say, you can choose to run it. You're not dependent on a third party on what you're going to run. And then the second piece is, does it have some other usage cases? And these things tend to work um, together. It is true we're in a phase right now where people talk more about a store of value usage of, and a lot of the questions here, I'm kind of pulling together several questions, a store of value usage case as opposed to a medium of exchange usage case. And I'm going to suggest there's a better framework to think about. And so a lot of, a bunch of people oh, well, you know, Bitcoin is not great for medium exchange now. The transaction fees are too high. Or it's really more of a store of value and they're fighting about the future. That's not really what they're fighting about, right? The, the philosophical question about if there should be large blocks and more capacity on the Bitcoin blockchain or smaller blocks is about how many layers the system is going to have. One camp says we have an opportunity now with this brand new system to do both important big transactions on the same blockchain that you're going to buy your coffee. And this is just a technological improvement that didn't used to exist in the world at large. And that's how we're going to do it. The other camp is, in effect, arguing for an architecture of money similar to the current system. So most civilians, and most of you are civilians, don't think about this, but the way the, let's see, U.S. dollar zone works, at the bottom of it, there is an RTGS, a real-time gross settlement system. It is called Fedwire. Fedwire is only accessible to financial institutions, and it has some characteristics that are unusual for consumer payment systems. There, it is irreversible. It is real time, it is not net, it's not gross out, and it's irreversible, the key one being. So if you send, if I am Chase and I send money to American Express or to the Bank of Bangladesh, it's gone. You can't call up and say, eh, two months later, I didn't really want to send the transaction, can you reverse it? And that's what big financial institutions use to settle among themselves. And then when you are at uh, the store and you're using your credit card, you are not actually clearing, purchasing and clearing and settling all at the same time. You are in a private network, in effect, that you have agreed to be a part of, of let's say MasterCard, and you're doing a credit transaction, and it will take actually several days before that filters through to the real-time growth settlement system and the money will leave your bank that's extending the credit and end up in the bank of the merchant that you bought the dress from. So some of the folks, well, I think most of the folks on the small block side are taking the following view. Having small blocks and making the base layer as decentralized and secure as possible is not just interesting because it makes it a store of value potentially, but it's interesting because it makes it a foundational layer that then you can run transaction type layers on top of it. These are the level two solutions. You will call them things like lightning networks, side channels. We will only see these starting coming into effect now that segregated witness has been deployed on the Bitcoin blockchain. And so fundamentally, this whole kind of argument that Bitcoin has been having with itself for the last year and will be having now for the next few months is are we trying to build a one layer transaction and settlement and store of value network or are we going to say there's an underlying layer that does that's expensive harder to use slower 
but it's the anchor for the faster, more risky small layers, which is very similar to how the financial system works now. And so there's an interesting question to see how that plays out. I kind of have an opinion about this, but it's 60-40, not 100-0. And we'll talk about this in a different session. Um, next question. Bitcoin, a private, decentralized, digital cryptocurrency, would completely shift currency control from the central banks to the masses. The governments would, as a consequence, lose a substantial amount of power and control over their population. Wouldn't the envisioned success of Bitcoin be a threat to government survival? If so, would the governments not step into its path of progress? Very common question. Very, actually packs a lot in this, this question as well, which is the following. It is true that many governments' initial reaction to cryptocurrency was neutral to slightly negative to, in some cases, very negative. I believe the initial reaction is not primarily because they think they're going to lose central banking control, but primarily because they are concerned about consumer protection on the one side or capital controls on the other side. Um, cryptocurrency and capital controls, I think, do not mix particularly well because there's no, unlike cash or wire transfers, there's no particularly easy way to stop a Bitcoin at a national border. In fact, it is a completely unknowable question where a Bitcoin lives. About three years ago, I taught a continuing legal education class where they taught law firm in New York about pension funds. And one of the questions was, can a pension, a certain type of US pension fund invest in Bitcoin? And the part we were discussing for half an hour with a bunch of legal experts and couldn't conclude was the law as currently written says it can only invest in assets that are located in the United States. Okay. Is a Bitcoin located in the United States? Well, certainly the ledger is not only in the United States, it's on thousands of computers around the world. Then someone might say, well, who has the private key? That's the person who can unlock that Bitcoin. Is the private key in the United States? Yeah, maybe, but of course, a private key is just a series of numbers and digits. So I could just pick up the phone, call, someone anywhere else on the planet, read them those numbers and digits, and they have the private key. Has the Bitcoin moved? Was it there all along? Was it in all places all at once, all at the same time? It's like one of these, you know, Zen sayings. So I think the concept of borders and Bitcoin, in fact, does not match very well. Um, could you see Bitcoin becoming a threat to... Okay, let's say it gets bigger. Well, people feel they'll lose control of monetary policy. I'm not sure. Um, I think what we'll see before that, before that, is that governments will issue their own cryptocurrencies. So I'm certain in time we will have a crypto euro and a crypto dollar. It's not going to be for a while. We're not there yet. And so the usage case of being able to transact digitally online and natively digitally is going to become increasingly valuable and important. It's definitely going to be how our machines communicate with each other. And I think it's inevitable that people will want national and sovereign currencies that exist in this format. And so it might be the case that once those exist, enough people use those that it dampens any effect of a certain independent cryptocurrency becoming the one world currency to rule them all. I don't think that's anyway a great outcome for uh, the world. There is value in countries being able to set different monetary policies uh, for 
the current state of their economy as opposed to not being set by one global currency. So I still think a more useful analog is something like gold or other forms of commodity money. And on the whole, that has been able to coexist beside next to national currencies. And I think that's my prediction of how it's going to play out. So you will have uh, independent cryptocurrencies, you'll have national currencies in the traditional form, and in time you'll have national cryptocurrencies. And I don't know if we're quite at the point of no return, but we're closing in, I think, over the next few years, if governments don't move against uh, national uh, independent cryptocurrencies soon, I think the competitive dynamics of wanting to keep the industries and the wealth that is built around them in their country are going to lead to no one really wanting to go against them. So, you know, it's clearly the case, using the internet as an analogy, the internet reduced governmental control of information. And, you know, and you can see how free the internet is per country tends to have some correlation to how much there's freedom and respect for certain types of human rights and free speech in particular. So, but very few countries have said, you know what, I'm just shutting down the internet altogether. We're going to operate without the internet. Uh, I think North Korea might be an example. China has their great firewall that tries to keep it within uh, certain boundaries and parameters. Uh, some of the North African or Middle Eastern states during the spring uprisings did in fact for certain periods of time shut off their internet access. But on the whole, governments have found the costs of shutting down the internet outweigh the benefits you get from more control over communication and government messaging. And I suspect for most relatively free nations, that's what's going to happen. Uh, I think it's only the right answer. I think it would be a mistake if, for example, the UK said, yes, I don't want any cryptocurrencies operating in my country. Now, all that's going to do is force them on the ground, but it could actually shut down the businesses being built around cryptocurrencies, in which case, I'm not sure that cryptocurrencies are going to go away, but they will leave the United Kingdom and just move over to one or another jurisdiction where those cryptocurrencies are still, or startups are still accepted. And countries don't really love the idea usually of losing uh, tech companies and the type of innovation that comes from that. So I think we're at close to the tipping point that unless there's a coordinated effort by many countries soon, it's probably here to stay in parallel with the existing monetary system. And, but I don't think that it's a threat, uh, not in the foreseeable future, to uh, overall central banking. Again, I know there are people that differ, to me, differ from me on both those topics, but uh, it's my view of the situation. China's ICO ban, does it create uncertainty for Bitcoin? After China announced the ban of ICOs, Bitcoin took a 5% hit and other cryptocurrencies took a larger nosedive. Long term, this may not impact Bitcoin, but what other threats exist and could come about in the future? Ugh. Bitcoin has spent, and all other cryptocurrencies, and just for some people here might not know what ICOs are. ICOs are initial coin offerings. And these are either for new types of currencies or services built, protocols built at a higher uh, level on top of another currency like Ethereum, let's say, that they are crowdfunding for that type of coin or token. And, you know, they're quite controversial right now because some of them, look like tokens and that's, those will probably be okay and some of them look like securities and different regulators are saying well if you're going to issue a security you have to comply with various securities regulations bitcoin and cryptocurrencies have lived their whole entire 
lives in uncertainty. Um, I can't remember how many times we've heard about things that are going to be fatal to this. It's gone down in value, not 5%, but 10%, 50%, 75%. But um, like most decentralized good ideas, I'll be very surprised if the concept goes away. Right? Like it is, there will be a lot of volatility. There will be a lot of uncertainty because nobody knows exactly what it's going to look like in 20 years. Is it going to be one major currency to rule them all? Will there be thousands of cryptocurrencies playing the trolls? How aggressively will the nation states play in this arena? Nobody knows. I mean, anyone who tells it they know, they don't really know. Um, so this uncertainty about what the long-term outcome is, is priced in minute by minute, 365 days a year, into the price of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. So it is as if you had a tech startup pre-IPO when it was still very risky, and its stocks traded every second of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. Well, any announcement, positive or negative, would send that, the price of that stock flying up or down. And that's what happens with cryptocurrencies. So I pay almost no attention to these topics. Um, I've been through so many, uh, as anyone who's been in the space a while, oh my God, it's all going to be wonderful from here on out, or oh my God, it's all going to be a disaster, that I've come to the conclusion that none of those things are anything to worry about because the central idea of decentralized ledgers is not going away ever. It is like email. It's not going to be uninvented. Maybe we won't be using CompuServe. Maybe we'll be using Gmail. Maybe we won't be using Hotmail. Maybe we'll be using something else. But no one's going to forget that email exists. And that, for me, in 2013, was one of the big breakthroughs. I was in New York. And it was when I had done my first Bitcoin transaction. I was talking to the finance director here at the university. who was in Cyprus. And it was Saturday afternoon. And I said, you know, it was Saturday afternoon in New York and Saturday night in Cyprus. I said, you know, I'm going to send you $20 worth of this crazy, weird Bitcoin thing. And kind of what I had in the back of my mind is if I wanted to send $20 worth of dollars from New York to Cyprus at that time using my bank, I'd have to wait till Monday and then I'd fill a bunch of forms and maybe I'll get there on Wednesday and the wire transfer fees would be like a $30 for a $20 transaction. And so anyway, I had him download a Bitcoin wallet and I did some hocus pocus that you do with, you know, the user interface is still very hocus pocus early tech style. And, you know, for seconds later, he's like, oh, look, I've seen tra no. transactions been broadcast and then later it confirmed. And I said, oh, wow, that's fascinating. It felt to me like the first time I had sent email. It was the first time that I was able to send money around the world in seconds, didn't have to ask permission from anyone, didn't have to ask permission from anyone, didn't have to get authorized. I think I paid back then, the fees were very low, a few pennies. Um, and it was there in a few seconds and confirmed in 10 minutes and then subsequently in an hour. And that would have taken several days otherwise. And I said, oh, well, we are still in the kind of awkward techie phase of it. It's not really ready for consumers. There's all types of things that can go wrong with it. But this isn't going away. It reminded me literally the first time I sent an email. And back then, sending emails was in, un, inconvenient. I mean, you had to go to a cafe, you had to log in. I didn't have an internet access at home. For those of you old enough to remember, modems, you'd have some going on. And then eventually you log on, and it takes forever. And someone could argue back then, well, you know, it might be faster to just go to your mailbox and drop a postcard and be done with it. And it might have been actually faster. Wouldn't get there faster, but it would be less work for you. But once you've seen email, you're like, okay, well, this stuff will clean up over time, but this general concept isn't going away. So my suggestion to all of you is don't focus on the micro level stuff. It is easy to get dragged in if you're in this field to the crisis of the day. And this is the type of field because it's decentralized, it's open, and it involves money. 
there's a lot of crisis, there's a lot of drama, there's a lot of tension, and that can get exhausting if you take it too seriously. And what I would ask you to think about instead is leave aside what's going to happen next week or in a month or in two months and ask yourselves, think about what's going to happen in five years, what's going to happen in ten years, how might this be important in my life or in society or in my career if it continues to exist. And I'm certain cryptocurrency and blockchain technologies and distributed ledgers and decentralized systems are going to continue to exist. I can't promise you it's going to be one currency or the other or one technology or the other. Are we going to be calling them public blockchains, private blockchains, distributed ledger technologies or whatever the flavor is of the month? That stuff changes. But the general concept isn't going anywhere any more than the internet didn't go anywhere. And so the more you focus on the long-term big picture of what types of things can be accomplished here that couldn't have been accomplished without it, both it's more interesting, it's less anxiety producing, and it's uh, much less stressful. And, you know, uh, I know these words are going to go in vain to some percentage of the group that are listening to this, but like, you know, as a general rule, like the least interesting, most anxiety producing thing you could do is I don't know, go day trade cryptocurrencies based on what you think is going to happen the next week or the next day. It's just like day trading small cap stocks. You're not likely to be successful. Um, and any particular person might be on any given day because of the law of large numbers, but it's not likely that it's a great uh, career and life choice to be tra day trading any financial instrument, and I think this is no exception. And anyone who tells you that they know what's going to happen, I have had the pleasure of being in contact with either directly or via Twitter, more or less all the experts in the space for several years, and some of them have had, some of their predictions have been right, some of them have been dead wrong, as have been mine, as have been many, many people here on the program, and here you're talking about some of our faculty and some of our outside faculty and some of our collaborators are literally the smartest people in the world on this topic. And the ability to predict specific, tangible things is much less uh, feasible than I think most people think. But at the big picture level, that this thing's important, that it's not going away, that there's going to be many different iterations of it, that it is something new in the world, uh, I'm highly confident in that statement and highly confident there is just infinite topics you can focus on, you can learn about in this area. We are, there was a time, you know, I'm looking at George here, where we arguably knew everything that was going on in the space. That time is long past. Uh, I was reading someone's newsletter, someone has a weekly newsletter in this space. And half the things in that weekly, oh, look at George. George, George is flaming me in our private chat. He says some of us still do. Um, okay, well, some of us older folks maybe uh, don't know everything. Don't, don't have a handle on everything. But I was reading a newsletter last week, and I mean, just dozens of things happening, some of which, some of which uh, I had never even heard of. So it's, it will eventually, you know, there was a time you could count the websites on the internet, right? You're like, oh, let's show you what it And then there was a time where, like, Yahoo thought they could, like, manually catalog the websites on the internet. And then you hit a point where there was just no way, right? The internet is more complex, has more uh, endpoints than the physical world at large. And so that's what's happening with these areas. We're going from the time where there's always one currency and there's these X people involved and here are the types of things that are happening to it's a very broad space where all types of things are happening and it's going to be <coughs> inevitable that not you can't keep up with everything. And so you should focus on certain things that might be of interest to you and might be of interest to your uh, area. And which might not, I know, 
is almost the opposite of what this session is about, not all the usages are going to be money oriented. We had a graduate from our program who was a doctor two years ago, and he's now, it's a great story, he was literally a practicing physician, and he did the program because he thought this was interesting, and he's now the chief medical officer of a startup that is focused on using a blockchain to allow people to share their data in a private, controlled, auditable basis with medical researchers. Um, that line of business is almost, if not completely, uh, undisturbed by whether the price of Bitcoin or Ethereum or Litecoin went up or down today. And it allows a type of data control and data auditability that was impractical before. And if, I don't know how that company will evolve, but if that company achieves its objectives or some other company like it achieves similar objectives, I suspect it will be a wonderful thing for the medical research profession because I would be much more comfortable sharing private data if I knew it was in a controlled manner. I could see who's viewed it. I could see which projects have access to it. I could retract access to those projects uh, for my data than if I, you know, the existence and I hand it over to someone and then trust that they will take good care of it. Centralized systems are not good at holding on to digital assets. Any of you who are in the States, Notice that yesterday, Equifax, uh, which is one of the major credit bureaus in the United States, announced that they had been hacked and they leaked, I think, 143 million dates of birth, social security numbers, addresses, names. I mean, credit bureaus have every piece of data about you. So, at a first approximation, all, or 60, 70% of all adults in America have their most private keys now floating about. And so, this is the problem with centralized uh, security models. Securing digital assets is very, very hard. It's very, very hard in Bitcoin, but it's very, very hard in everything else. And um, solutions that allow that to happen in a more controlled manner might end up being very interesting, even if they have nothing to do with the ultimate use of cryptocurrency as money in one way or another. Okay, I have run long, but I feel like I felt I needed to since I had the introduction at the beginning. I know I didn't get to even you know half the questions we had today, but I tried to combine some where people were asking similar items. I think we should set the principle that we do end on approximately the right time, even though this time it is late. So, George, unless you think there's something I need to address right now, we should probably bring this to the close. We should move the discussion uh, to the forums. And it is very exciting for us uh, to have you all with us. Um, we have loved every group we ever had. You are the biggest group, so hopefully there'll be even more to love uh, among your group. By the way, because even though we've started, people can could catch up if you have a friend. I think it's still okay to bring them in today to still join uh, the course. And if there's anything else you need, please reach out to George or me. Thank you very much, everyone. And next week, Andreas and Demobilis will be telling you about the Byzantines General's problem, which is the concept in distributed systems and computer science that Bitcoin has, under certain conditions and parameters, solved, which is how a set of people who don't know or trust each other can come to a common decision. So tomorrow, next session, you'll be getting into a little bit of the underlying theory of it. Get through the technical sessions. It's important to understand the underlying mechanics of how it works. And then we'll talk a little bit more about applications on the second half of the course. Thank you very much, everyone.